Hi everyone, um, welcome to um, another uh, live stream session with myself. This is a Shobi live stream that we do. My name is Abdul Chohan. Um, I'm the former principal. I'm a former principal and CEO of a trust here in the UK. Um, I'm also currently the vice president of learning for Shobi and Socrative, where we kind of have our focus on assessment and feedback. Um, my guest today. Um, is none other than the Welsh, Welsh educationalist, I should say, and uh, Emeritus Professor of Educational Assessment at the UCL Institute of Education, Dylan William. Uh, I'm sure many educators watching today, many of you have contacted me as well to kind of say that you're very much looking forward to this conversation. Um, so Dylan, thank you very much for agreeing to do this and um, welcome to the live stream. Um, welcome. So one thing I kind of read about you, that you went to... Uh, Altrincham Grammar, which is not a million miles away from where Bolton is. So um, that was your secondary school? Uh, for part of the time. So I started my secondary schooling in Cardiff. I went to Whitchurch Grammar School, uh, as it was then. Then I went to Altrincham Grammar School for the last, I think, probably five years, uh, from 13 to the age of 18. So are you, uh, important question first, are you red or blue? Are you um, a football fan, not a football fan? Not a football fan, a rugby fan. Oh, never rugby understood. Fan. Never understood. Understood football. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Well, let's kind of get to it. We've got kind of thirty minutes, and um, I'd love to kind of um, hear more about uh, assessment and, and feedback and so on, and really kind of what's working education. But I kind of want to start off my first question: um, What is assessment? You know, in this most basic term, like when we talk about assessment. How would you define assessment? I think the simplest way to define assessment is to draw on what Lee Kronbach said about 50 years ago, and just basically to describe an assessment as a procedure for drawing conclusions. We give students things to do, we look at what they did, we draw conclusions. And I think the powerful thing about that definition is it makes very clear that some conclusions are warranted and some conclusions are not. So what we call validity really isn't a property of a test or an assessment. It's a property of the conclusions. How valid are the conclusions that we can draw? Because a test might deliver and support valid conclusions for some students and not others. For example, if you've got a maths test with a high reading demand, if you give it to fluent readers, then differences in scores are probably due to differences in maths achievement. If you give it to a much more mixed group, some of whom can read well, some of whom can't, then some of the variation in scores will be caused by differences in math achievements, but some of it will be caused by differences in reading ability. So you don't know what you know. And that's the important point. Think about when you see the results, what do you think yeah. you know? And that's why I think it's a really powerful way because the same, the same assessment delivered in different circumstances might support different conclusions. Um, true, 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 true. Um, so, Typically speaking, like in education, for them, for those of us that have kind of um, been in education for a long time, like in the in in classrooms and so on, we've quite often done the wrong things really well. Yeah, um, we've done things like learning styles and brain gyms and all that kind of stuff and so on. So, at this moment in time, um, and and maybe maybe it's not just for this moment in time. Where should uh, school leaders be putting their focus in terms of the least investment and the greatest impact, especially at this moment in time when people are kind of looking at budgets and, you know, I, I don't need to kind of talk about the state of, of the UK government at the moment and so on and, and what, what teachers are going through and school leaders, all the school leaders and MAT leaders I'm speaking to, certainly in the UK and actually in a lot of other countries as well. Um, finances are a big, big thing, right? So for me, it's kind of asking that question, where should the focus be, the least investment for the greatest impact? Well, the first thing to do is not beat ourselves up. I mean, the reason that we invested in learning styles, because it seemed plausible, and there wasn't such a strong tradition of randomized controlled trials to tell us that it wasn't a good idea. So I think one of the things that's really changed in the last 30 years is that people have figured out that, first of all, randomized controlled trials aren't perfect, but they're, they're, they're pretty useful. And we've also figured out how to do randomized controlled trials really well. And even um, if we can't do a randomized controlled trial, use some other techniques 
from research design to draw conclusions that are pretty strong. I think the big takeaway is the, the effects we're looking for are really pretty small. So there's nothing that we can do that's going to have, us, have a huge effect. If there was something like that, we'd have found it by now. And so I, I talk in terms of best bets, because as I'm fond of saying, um, you know, in education, nothing works everywhere and everything works somewhere. The important point is under what circumstances does this work? So I think school leaders need to be critical consumers of educational research. And I think what you need to do is to look at, first of all, does it solve the problem we have? Because if you've already solved the problem, the research doesn't matter. The second thing is how much extra achievement will you get? And not in terms of effect sizes, because nobody understands effect sizes. It should be in terms of extra months of learning per year. And then we need to look at how much will it cost in money? Sure. But more importantly, in terms of teacher time. Yeah. Because teacher time is the most precious commodity in our system. Uh, student time is also pretty important, but teacher time, I think, is even more precious. Every hour we have teachers spending on one thing is an hour we don't have to spend on something else. And when you look at that in detail, you find, I think there are two things that the research shows are pretty powerful focuses for school investment. One is curriculum development, and the other is helping teachers be more responsive to their students' needs through formative assessment. Curriculum development can be powerful, but we're currently not able to predict in advance whether a particular curriculum is going to be more important, more effective. So I think right now, helping teachers make greater use of classroom formative assessment is probably the most likely place to produce big impacts or reasonable impacts on student achievement without too much um, intrusion into teachers' time. Just to quantify that, a recent randomized controlled trial by the Education Endowment Foundation, well, that was actually conducted by the National Institute for Economic and Social Research, found that having teachers spend 1% of their time on meeting monthly to hold each other accountable for making changes in their practice produced a 20% increase in student progress in key stage four. So we don't know of anything else that comes close to that. 1% change, 1% of teachers' time spent in a different way produced 20% increase in the student progress. That seems to me to be worth looking at. Lots of other things also need to, need to be done. You know, we need to look after student well-being. We need to ensure that students attend school because if they're not attending school, then none of the rest matters. There's lots of things we could do, but the one that seems to be the most effective at a policy level in terms of making the schools more effective for their students is classroom formative assessment. Mm. Um, you, and and I've heard you I've heard you talk in the past uh, where you've kind of mentioned um, where, where you've discussed kind of getting teachers to act their way into a new way of thinking, you know, um, right. and you know those kinds of actions that are needed on a day to day basis, like how 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 do how do school leaders kind of um, bring that to fruition? You know, how do we change those kinds of behaviors to to ensure that the the formative assessment element and those that kind of thinking um, is actually actioned and not just kind of delivered and thought about? Well, I think that's the most important thing that I've learned in the last 25, 30 years of working with teachers to improve practice is mm -hmm. that most people tend to think of this as a knowledge problem, that teachers don't know stuff. And if we have so-called experts tell them the stuff that they don't know, somehow they'll be better teachers. It doesn't work because it's not a knowledge problem. So for example, you know, wait time. We know that teachers yeah. don't wait very long at the end of a question before giving students a chance to answer and move on to somebody else or answer it themselves. But reminding teachers of that research has about as much impact on classroom practice as reminding smokers of the harmful effects of smoking. Mm. It doesn't have any impact because it's not a knowledge problem. It's a habit change problem. So I think that there's a lot of literature in habit change, particularly a lot of research in health education that helps us get this right, but we're not currently using it. So I would say to school leaders, think of helping teachers get better as a habit change problem rather than a knowledge acquisition problem. And then think about five things. One is giving teachers a choice about what to work on. I'm not convinced by whole school priorities. The idea that the same thing would work for an art teacher, a maths teacher, a PE teacher, and a dance teacher makes no sense to me. 
The second thing is then expecting teachers to adapt them to fit their own practice, but within a framework that ensures that the change doesn't become what Ed Hartle called a lethal mutation. Um, okay. Allowing teachers to take small steps. You can't change habits quickly. Then holding teachers accountable for making these changes and providing the support. You know, basically, you know, supporting them, helping them, giving them feedback on the things they want feedback about rather than walk into their classrooms and telling them what they're doing wrong. That seems to me to be the most powerful recipe for improvement. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Um, so in in the past, I've uh, also kind of like, certainly from a UK perspective, and actually in, in quite a few other places as well, I've heard, we hear the term assessment for learning, right? Yeah. Um, and that's kind of been something that certainly been in the UK, um, and it's been kind of worked on by school leaders quite significantly as effective policies and approaches and so on as well. How would you uh, compare or is there a distinction between assessment for learning and formative assessment? Uh, there is a distinction and I think it's really important. So first of all, it's important to remember that the term assessment for learning first came into prominence out of a concern for better summative assessment. Okay. So if you look at the assessment reform group, their policy priority grew out of the records of achievement movement. The records of achievement movement came out of recognition that back in the 1960s and 70s, most students left school with no document about anything they'd achieved. Because yeah. O-levels were designed for the top 20%, CSEs for the next 40% sometimes. So, you know, at least, at least 40% and often half of kids left school with no documentation. And the records of achievement movement said, that's wrong. We've got to give these students some record of what they've achieved in 10 years in school. And so originally the assessment for learning movement was trying to come up with assessment that would actually have a positive backwash into learning. Portfolios at the age of 16, for example, that would actually impact learning productively. So assessment for learning includes things like motivation. There'll be a test on Friday. Some students will prepare for the test because they care about getting a good score. So that is assessment for learning, but it's not formative assessment. If I set a test and students sit down and finish off the test, even if I don't score the answers, they will actually benefit because of what psychologists call retrieval practice. That's assessment yeah. for learning. It's not formative yeah. assessment. If the students who are confident they, their answers were correct find out those answers were incorrect, you get an additional benefit called the hypercorrection effect. Okay. The more confident you are when you're wrong, the bigger the benefit of being corrected. That's assessment for yeah. learning. It's not formative assessment. For me, formative assessment is a tiny corner of assessment for learning, but it is the one that has the biggest impact on student achievement. It is using evidence about what's going on in students' heads to make adjustments to what's happening in the classroom that better meet those students' learning needs. So that's the big idea here, is just using evidence to adjust what happens in classrooms to meet student learning needs. Assessment for learning becomes formative assessment when the evidence generated is actually used to make a difference. Hmm. Okay, so it's 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 actioning that um, the evidence, right? It's it's yes. kind of using that data then to plan next steps to be able to yep. kind of say, hey, what are we doing next? Or being able to identify misconceptions, being able to kind of you know measure whether learning has actually happened or not. Absolutely. Um. So. With respect to, so this is, this is a, a question that I kind of, I, I come across quite a lot with leaders as well. Um, quite often leaders spend a significant amount of time kind of identifying good teaching, good teaching as part of kind of their quality assurance mechanisms and sure. so on. And we're kind of seeing this now um, across trust or larger organizations and not just in the UK, but internationally school groups, independent schools, I've got 20, 30 schools. How do I kind of make sure that, you know, there's good quality teaching that's kind of happening. I always use this quote that says um, um, good schools are consistent, but outstanding schools are consistently good. The ability to kind of deliver, like, deliver consistently good learning experiences for students and then being able to kind of get leaders to define what does consistently good um, look like. But the question that I have for you is how easy is it to identify good teaching? You know? I think it's impossible. 
I think it's impossible without a huge amount of data and a massive amount of time. So first of all, yeah. That's really interesting, by the way, that you say yeah. that. I'm sure a lot of school leaders sitting there will be thinking, right, okay, yeah. we want to know more about this. <laughs> it's one of the most counterintuitive things. Everybody in education thinks they know good teaching when they see it. But just think about it for a minute. If we define learning as a relatively long-term change in what students can do, yeah. we're not interested that the students can do what we've taught them today at the end of the lesson or tomorrow. We're interested that they can do it in three or four weeks' time. So when yeah. you're trying to judge teaching, you're trying to judge how much of what's happening in this classroom right now will these children remember in six weeks' time. Yeah. That's hard. Yeah. We, as, we as human beings seem to be naturally programmed to remember stories. But the problem is we don't want students to remember the stories. We want them to remember the, the content that the stories are about. And so often students love these lessons with, uh, with you know, with, with lots of um, action or movement or um, storytelling. But the question is, how much of that do they remember six weeks later? There's an additional point, which is that psychologists have recently discovered that some um, difficulty, what Robert Bjork, the professor of uh, psychology at University of, College, the University of California, Los Angeles, calls desirable difficulties. So in other words, lessons where students struggle a little bit because they have to think actually yeah. lead to better long-term learning. So when you consider that the performance in the learning task is often inversely correlated with how much it gets remembered six weeks later, yeah. and you're trying to predict how much of this is happening six weeks later, it's not su surprising to think that, it, to realize it's not very easy. Even more important, there's lots of evidence now that some teachers are very good at getting kids to pass this year's test some teachers are better at getting students to pass next year's test. Some teachers build better foundations for learning. And there's actually some pretty good randomized control trial evidence here that teachers who are effective in the short term are often less effective in the long term. So I think a bit of humility is needed here. Everybody thinks they know good teaching, but the feedback loops are really long. You know, that's why I don't think artificial intelligence is gonna have much impact in education for years. It's easy to see whether a move in chess has improved the player's position or not. But if the feedback loop in education is two or three years and maybe even five years long, then you can't do these massive numbers of trials that artificial intelligence machines need. So I think a bit of humility is needed. I think it's really complicated. And if that doesn't convince you, there are also some pretty good studies that show that even experienced heads and deputies can't mm. even reach chance levels of identifying wow. more effective teachers from less effective teachers when they're shown videos of their teaching. Uh, there's, a, there's a classic study where 165 heads and deputies were shown eight videos. Four of the teachers had been consistently more effective than average over each of the last three years. Four of the teachers had been consistently less effective than average over each of the four years. And these heads and deputies were shown these videos and were asked, is this one of the good teachers or one of the bad teachers? Flipping a coin would have got you the right answer four times out of eight. The average correct response was 3.85. Wow. They couldn't even reach chance levels. So basically, a bit of humility here. What's the conclusion? Stop trying to grade teachers and instead try to just help them improve. Hmm. I've got so many questions coming into my head now. I've, I had some questions written down and uh, they've all just kind of disappeared now. And I want to ask you like completely off the kind of stuff because to be honest with you, you know, my um, partner's a teacher, friends, family, lots of people are teachers and so on. And certainly in the UK and even in any, any of those countries where the, you've got kind of inspection systems that come in and, you know, they kind of want to see the quality of teaching it, whether that is the pressure that that creates on a teacher or on a school that week is kind of like ridiculous. And I have seen on social media and stuff like people, new yeah. teachers coming into the profession, kind of really feeling the pressure around this. And then, you know, they uh, sort of leave, you know, if they've not got that kind of, you know, support mechanism and so on, it, it does kind of bring that question up around, 
you know, inspection framework. I'm not necessarily talking about the UK now. There's lots of other countries that have inspection frameworks and inspection systems that kind of go in. And quite often it's related to kind of, you know, going into the classroom and seeing this teacher perform and has learning happened and so on. And there's a lot of what you're saying and a lot of things around cognitive science that really kind of doesn't really fit in with that because how can you measure that in that instant right. kind of thing? So, you know? so, you know, I think there are lots of problems with the inspection regime in England. Let's not, let's not yeah. lump in England with Scotland and Northern Ireland and Wales because they have pretty different systems now. There's a lot wrong with the inspection regime in England, but there's a lot more wrong with the way that schools have responded to that. Mm, so okay. I often ask heads, are your teachers worried about Ofsted? And if they say yes, I say, in that case, you're not doing your job properly. Because the, te the head's job is to protect the teachers, yeah. to make sure that the teachers are getting on with what the school has agreed you need to do to improve. And if yeah. teachers are second guessing what Ofsted is looking for, you're never gonna make any progress in terms of moving the quality of teaching forward in the school. So I think so I see the job of the principal as, as protecting the, the teachers from those external pressures so the teachers can get on with getting better at their task. And so, you know, yes, there is a dysfunctional inspection regime. It's not, in my view, fit for purpose. It may be better than it was, but it's still not providing value for money. It's still not providing useful information. And it's not going to change anytime soon. So the yeah. important thing yeah. is, let's make sure that our responses to these crazy pressures that schools uh, are subjected to, let's make sure our responses to those are as good as they can be in terms of the interests of our learners. Yeah. I mean, a lot of my conversations with uh, senior leadership teams and um, with organisations in the UK and internationally as well have kind of, I think they're they kind of coming down to three key things in terms of like building consistently good learning environments. I'm not saying that these are, these are absolutes, but certainly mm -hmm. good places uh, the, the one is direct instruction uh, and what, one of the things that I feel is that like you said the teacher is a really important resource and the fact that the teacher is writing on the wall explaining a concept and an idea and so on um, is a really powerful thing and one thing for sure is that we've now got all sorts of technology that allows you to kind of record that explanation not necessarily video but just describe yep. and all that kind of stuff and making that available for students to be able to kind of see and watch and hear again the, the place where I was principal and where I was a senior leader for many years we had students that came from Afghanistan from refugee students and so on there was a huge issue around kind of you can't just explain something once or twice or three times and expect them to understand but they were they wanted to learn and the fact that they had access to those resources um and being able to present learning in that way and that and make that direct instruction available after the time because technology allowed us to was something that was kind of quite powerful so direct instruction i think is a, potentially something that we could do uh quite quite powerfully and 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 uh, in a way that is kind of um you know, that extends beyond the typical school day because students can have access to it. Right, but I don't think that's a very helpful focus because everybody interprets direct instruction in their own way. Mm. So people, you know, people either react positively or negatively to it because they have, a, they, they have some idea about what direct instruction means. Hardly anybody goes back and looks at the work of Secret Engelman, who invented the term. And what's interesting to me is that, you know, formative assessment, for example, is at the heart of effective direct instruction. So first yeah. of all, you teach in a way to avoid misconceptions. You mm -hmm. make connections to previous knowledge. You use frequent practice testing. And you also do frequent checks for understanding with, yeah. by actually getting everybody in the class to respond. So what is interesting to me is, is how, um, how much formative assessment, direct instruction, capital D, capital I, as defined by mm -hmm. Engelman, re actually requires in practice. So the difficulty is we, in, in education, you know, all these things, yeah, problem-based learning, project-based learning, differentiated yeah. instruction, direct instruction. We don't have any agreed definitions of these terms, so people yeah. end up talking past each other, uh, and people just make these things mean what they want them to mean, which means often that we don't get the progress we could reasonably expect if we implemented the science reasonably effectively. Mm. So... Um so alongside direct instruction, like feedback and the formative assessment aspect becomes kind of quite 
quite key, right? Because, um, yeah, well, you know, yeah, I mean, just, that... you know, feedback is part of good feedback is part of direct instruction. Uh, the important point about feedback is we need to be very careful because more feedback is not necessarily better. The classic study, study by Kluger and Denisi, found that in almost two out of every five cases, feedback reduced performance, it reduced learning. And so we really need to understand what kinds of feedback are most effective. Because if we give more feedback, but it's the kind that makes things worse, then it's not going to help. So we need teachers to understand the kinds of feedback. And ultimately, you know, I think what's really messy about the feedback research is it comes down to relationships. Every teacher knows the same feedback given to one pupil will make that pupil try harder and to a similar pupil will make that other pupil give up. So the teacher has to know when to push, when to back off. Yeah. And the pupils need to trust the teacher that they have their best interests at heart and that they know what they're talking about. And that's why I think most of the research which is done in universities on yeah. undergraduate students is not particularly helpful here. It's about building relationships so that students trust that teachers have their best interests at heart and giving you feedback because I want you to succeed rather than I want, rather I want to give you a mark. Mm. That's, that's actually quite, quite, uh, quite, quite powerful in, in many ways. Um, and um, with respect to um, like formative assessment, I mean, there's a whole bunch of tools that are kind of out there that schools are using and strategies that people are using to kind of... Um, you know, do and, and your phrase, I've heard it said many times. I think you've mentioned it for, for said it many, many years, but that minute by minute kind of yep. you know, checking. Um, are there strategies, approaches that you've seen that kind of work quite well in the classroom that are worthwhile for, for schools to kind of explore and so on? Uh, certainly around the minute by minute kind of uh, approach right. to formative assessment. Well, I think the most important thing is that there's no approach that's going to work for every teacher of every, yeah. of, of every subject because. Yeah. You know, teaching dance is different from teaching drama, is different from teaching art and PE. But I think that when you're teaching a group of students, I think the one thing I would say that is most powerful and least prevalent in our practice yeah. in England in particular is teachers making decisions about what to do next on the basis of evidence from the whole group. Most teachers still rely on feedback from the usual suspects. You know, the fact that one student in a class gave you the right answer to the question does not mean the other students in that class are ready to move on. So if I could say one thing, I'd say to teachers, you need better evidence. And it goes back to the original definition of assessment. An assessment is a procedure for drawing conclusions. I, want, I need evidence from my students about what's going on in their heads to make a better decision. I need broader evidence. I need evidence from every single pupil in the group rather than just the confident ones. And the questions I use to get that evidence need to be thought through. So rather than asking, would your weight be the same on the moon? A much better question would be, would your mass be the same on the moon? Because most students get that wrong. In primary school, is point two, which is bigger, 0.25 or 0.3? Many students think that 0.25 is bigger than 0.3 because 25 is bigger than three. So it's actually better evidence for having deeper questions and better evidence by having broader sets of responses. That would seem to me to be the most powerful uh, focus for a school's professional focus, uh, professional development to make this minute I, by minute assessment yeah. of the reality. Because I think I think that is really kind of quite quite powerful. And and if schools enable the sharing of these approaches as well, so there's kind of peer sharing, teacher to teacher, in in, in the way in which you know, they're asking the questions and so on, that becomes kind of quite a, a useful thing to do because we're seeing we're seeing the increase of trusts and, and school groups that are working together uh, here in the UK as well. So that kind of talent pool increases and you get people that are teachers that are kind of quite passionate and, and the quality of, of questioning um, is accessible for people to be able to see, hey, that's a better question than this and being able to kind of peer assess that uh, between teachers as well. And this is it's important, quite important to us that the technology often gets in the way. So people want yeah. these kinds of electronic voting systems. I'm saying, you know, is that equation on the board now correct? Please vote yes or no. Mini whiteboards, finger voting for a multiple choice question, A, B, C, D, or E. Which of these is correct? Keep the technology simple yeah. and ephemeral. If we want to create a culture in our classrooms where students feel okay about making mistakes, the last thing we should do is record every single one of them in an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah. So I think it's really important to understand that these formative assessment systems 
are just to give teachers real-time information about what's yeah. going on in children's heads so they can make better decisions to meet their students' learning needs. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Dylan, um, I thought this might happen. I kind of, we kind of start these conversations and then like 30 minutes just flies by. I've got a whole bunch of other questions I want to ask and carry on kind of asking questions and, and talking about this. But um I really appreciate you taking the time out um, to kind of speak to us. I know that there'll be a lot of educators that will be kind of like super... Uh, excited and and wanting to kind of listen to this and I'm sure there's huge takeaways from this as well there's been a whole bunch of teachers asking me about links to this and we'll be sharing this out with um, educators across the board as well um, so really appreciate your time um, to kind of share your thoughts and opinions um, with us and the education community today thank you so much you're very welcome okay thank you very much everyone thanks for